There was a very large marsh which had a wall around it, so it had been embanked from, we don't know when, probably the Roman times, it's time immemorial. It had had commissioners looking after it through the Middle Ages and the Tudor period. And it appears in the Tudor period a lot of drainage work was done, but what we don't really know because there are no records. The records start in the early 17th century when it's managed by a local body who are paying rates towards um, to a bailiff and some staff for it. And most of the minute books, I'm afraid, for the next 200 years are all about the brambles and the nettles they're clearing from the drainage ditches. Um, there was some, I would say exactly industry, but it wasn't commercially farmed. It weren't people living there and doing small holdings. There were fields which were let out for grazing cattle, for growing willow, for osiers and so on. So it was sort of a commercial area with a gate on it, which was just very near to where we are now. So it, it wasn't small holdings. It wasn't a peasant community. It was a commercially managed area from, of marshland. And there is a whole history of marshes and how they're managed. And they have a very special laws and a very special economy. Probably a bit of wild filing, probably some pirates. Throughout the period of the Civil War, and at the end of it, the marsh and a lot of properties in Greenwich, including the local manor, were passed to the Crown and they gave it to various favourites who can get it back and so on. There's this story about how everybody in the world who isn't um, a, a, a British subject of another manor is a subject of the manor of East Greenwich, in that it became convenient for the Crown to when people who were like in the American colonies to ascribe them to the manor of East Greenwich although of course I mean they never went there and had no actual connection with it. Eventually by the late 17th century it had passed to the ownership of Sir John Morden who was a wealthy merchant who had set up a charity on Blackheath which still exists very much still exists um, in order to provide lodgings to um, merchants who had lost their ships at sea and who in their old age were thus impoverished. And the story goes that in Sir John Morden's will, he left the trust to be managed by the Turkey Company, which was then of course the, uh, the people who would have run the ships. And if the Turkey Company failed, it would pass the East India Company. If the East India Company failed, it would pass the Corporation of London who have it at the moment and they appoint the trustees. If the Corporation of the City of London should fail, which seems a fairly unlikely scenario, it will pass to eight discreet gentlemen of the County of Kent. But at the moment, uh, Morden College still owns the freehold and much of the western part of the peninsula and certainly the bit that Ballast Key is on. And from where I sit, I think I can see one of their ownership plaques on the buildings here, which is the Kentish Invicta, of course, because of course they were a Kentish charity. Greenwich was in Kent until, of course, the 1890s. The, of course, a lot of the peninsula didn't actually belong to Morton College, they belonged to other people. And in the 17th century, the government set up a gunpowder works on a site which has since evolved to become what we know as Enderby Wharf. And the birthplace basically of modern telecommunications um, and they didn't own a lot of the East Bank where we had um, uh, in people's memory now a power station and where the Parlour Inn is and the gas works of course none of that belonged to Morton College but the sites they did own and this includes of course Ballast Key and the immediate sites both sides of it and near it and the housing area that around about 1800, 1820, they decided to develop the area for industry. And in doing so, they parceled out sites and appointed a head developer who was instructed to find factories or industrialists who would manage the area and who would provide a decent decent buildings with and reputable industry 
and the whole history from then on is how some of the industries weren't particularly reputable and some of them were extremely so. I, the ballast key and the immediate areas around it will have been promoted for the coal trade down from Durham and to a certain extent Newcastle and Blythe to bring in the coal into London. And that was done by somebody called Cole's Child, who we can see his grave in Bromley Churchyard now. And he built the wharf, which is to the immediate, my immediate left, and the houses which surround us now, and of which the street names are very largely to do with the Durham Coalfield. I mean, the best known one is the Pelton, where Pelton West and Pelton Main Collieries were in existence up until the 1940s. Um, there's now a golf course on the site of Pelton, Maine. Uh, arguably, the industries which came onto the peninsula are all some way to do with the coal trade. The river here would have been full of coal ships. I mean, even until, I suppose, even 20 years ago, there were still some colliers coming up from um, the various coal fields. But it wasn't just coal for fuel, although the coal would power the power stations and we have the Greenwich um, power station just to my right here. And or indeed the gas works and we had some very major gas works up and down the river. But the byproducts that were produced out of the coal would have fueled vast numbers of industries down the river here and along the peninsula's riverside were various works producing chemicals of various sorts coal tar soap in the soap works and um, briquettes to start your fire off when you, it didn't do well made out of tar and waste materials. There was even a large factory making tarred roadblocks with which roads would have been paved throughout the early 20th century and which would have been used partly for the trams to bed them in well. So uh, this area, the fact that Morden College was promoting it with the collier collier owners and with the um, people like Cole's Child who are bringing coal in is, was a whole industrial complex which of course fell apart from the early 80s onwards. But Cole's Child had a number of um, enterprises which he was after. The pier here didn't last very long and uh, you could see masonry blocks in the river until relatively recently they may still be there on the foreshore when the tide goes out i understood from um, people who ran lovell's wharf next door which was a commercial wharf into the 1980s that there were some problems with the way the tide comes up against the wharf walls here which may account for the fact the pier was unsuccessful coast child of course let the um, wharf which he called Greenwich Wharf out in sections. Um, we now know it as um, Lovells, um, but Shaw Lovell were only there from the 1920s, used it as um, a metals transshipment area, built their London computer centre there which was there and used by the GLC until five or six years ago. The massive great um, carpet in it with the word Lovells woven into the carpet. Um, uh, but they left, decided to leave Greenwich, I think partly because of the difficulties of transport to the wharf. They left behind us, people remember two butters cranes, which I would have loved to have done more research on, but whoever renovated them in the 1980s unscrewed the brass plates off them with their code numbers on. So although the crane manufacturers were friendly, they couldn't tell us any details about them because they would have need the code in their records. Um, the cranes were removed by Morden College, giving no notice to anybody one day, about 10 years ago, 12 years ago possibly, and which was a pity because the council had very much decided to, they should remain as a feature with whatever was built on the site. Um, the, what they called Greenwich Wharf, which was the bit here we call Lovells, um, had previously been a, um, partly a cement works, and various other things, including an ice factory where there was an ice well, which I understand was on the site until presumably it was demolished by the current owners who wouldn't have known about it. There is also was a, a wall of random stone here, which has been re replicated 
on Wareham, Dorset railway station. And I understand that the one here is about to be rebuilt by the developer as a feature. Further down, there was um, a series of um, boatyards, the most important of which was Piper's, which, um, say, 1890s onwards, was the place where a number of extremely famous racing barges were built, particularly Geralda, um, which you, you see on calendars and <laughs> placemats all the time. And Geralda never lost a race she was in, although she was extremely bad at moving cement and bricks and other things that she was supposed to do commercially. And they made a number of other barges um, and lighters and so on. Uh, the very, very old tide mill, which was found down on Granite Wharf um, a couple of years ago, which is 12th century, um, points to this being an industrial area for a very, very long time. If we are right, there may have been a settlement here in this immediate area. I've been mean, going back to, you know, what do I mean, time immemorial, certainly before the conquest, but there's been no proof of that. Um, what there certainly was by the 17th, 18th century, there were various buildings and cottages, there were pubs, there was a pub called the Golden Anchor, and I think, God, I can't remember the other one, there were two pubs, certainly, various cottages, various houses. One of the most important things which was in this whole area was warehouses for Crowley's ironworks. Crowley was a um, black country and, and tyne based iron founder, very, very important in the Industrial Revolution. And he seems to have had a warehouse here, presumably selling metal objects of various sort to the maritime trades. Only thing I know he sold were barnacles for slaves, which is not at all good. But he had a series of warehouses. And then around the first years of the 19th century, I mean 1810, something like that, possibly earlier, the then Morden College surveyor, who was Biggs, um, seems to have been commissioned by the college to build houses and some sort of structures here, which were more than what we assume was uh, uh, cottages and maybe uh, some older, grander buildings, certainly where the power station was, there had been a, a very major grand house in the 19th century, run by the redoubtable Mrs Eastwood. You must remember there were women in the, the riverside trades for many, many years. And um, the heavy haulage, the bricks that built London came up by sailing barge. And um, what went out was the rubbish, which of course it still very largely does today, although it doesn't go out under sail.